do want to do tonight is I want to talk about two big questions. If you have the realm of truth and you have the realm of taste, which, which one is religion fit in? Right? Is it a matter of truth? Or is it just a matter of taste and personal preference? Like your favorite music. Um, and then once we've looked at that question, and, I, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that religion actually goes in both of the boxes. That it belongs in both the realm of taste and the realm of truth. But then once I look at that, and I, I'm going to argue that claims, important religious claims, some of them are going to go in the truth box. They're going to be truth claims. Then I want to say, well, okay, so we have, now we have all these important religious claims in the truth box. Can they all be true? And I want to examine that question. And I want to argue that I don't think they can all be true. So let me give a disclaimer before I move any further. This, the disclaimer is this. Um, I come from a, t a particular worldview. I come from a particular point of view, religious point of view. I'm a Christian. Everybody has a point of view, right? No matter what, even if you're an atheist or non-religious or agnostic, everybody here has a point of view. You have a view of the world, a way you make sense of the world. You have a set of beliefs that you, that you hold on to. And so we all have a bias of some kind, right? What that means is it's hard for us to be objective about things. And I admit right up front, I have a bias. But even though we can't get rid of our bias, I can't get rid of mine, you can sort of correct for it. Knowing that you have it ahead of time, you can try to make, make accommodations and maybe take some extra steps of caution, do a little extra research, do a little extra questioning to try to accommodate your bias. So I invite all of you to do the same thing that I'm doing. But I'm not an expert on religion, I'm a philosopher. So it means, I guess, I'm an expert in thinking about stuff, right? Using reason and logic to understand things. So that's what I want to do tonight. I want to take this big issue and try to and to help you and help myself navigate through it just using reason, just asking questions, looking at things, using reason and logic. That's what I can do. And as I tell my students at the university, I'm not here to tell you what to think at the end. I'm here to teach you how to think. So, two big things. I'm going to ask which box does religion belong in, the truth box or the taste box, and if there are claims, important religious claims, in the truth box, then can they all be true? And I don't think they can. So for instance, so think of this as our boxes, right? So, so here are some things that we typically assign to the truth box, the truth claims, right? Claims about astronomy, right? Claims about medicine and research, say cancer research. Claims about other kinds of science and evolution. <clears throat> claims about law, right? Being innocent or guilty. These are claims we think belong in the realm of truth. They're important. There's a lot riding on them, right? The cure to cancer. Can we save lives? There's high stakes. People's futures are being decided in courtrooms, whether they're going to spend a lifetime in jail or go free. High stakes. This is a world of truth. That's why we fight over these things. That's why we argue about them. But then there's the realm of taste, right? Like, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Or what kind of music do you like, right? Or um, do you like Picasso? Uh, or do you, does he kind of confuse you and maybe find it a little disturbing? Um, but where is religion going to go, right? Oh, and by the way, there's another one that could be argued about, like, you know, which is the better school? Or should you prefer Jayhawks or, or Powercats, right? Which should it be? Now, I think everyone here probably has similar tastes in this matter. Um, but what about religion? Where is that going to go? Some people think maybe it should go over here in the truth box. And this is what we're asking tonight. But some people would say, no, wouldn't it be a lot easier? Wouldn't the world be a better place if we just moved it over to the taste box? And people would stop fighting over it. We'd stop having wars about it. We, um, we wouldn't get so worked up and uptight about it. So, you like Buddha, I like Jesus, say, hey, what's the big deal, right? Nobody kills each other over their favorite flavors of ice cream. But of course, some people also want to move this one over to the truth of <laughs> so I think there is a truth of the matter in that particular case. So, so what I want to do is, again, we're looking, where should religion go? Should it go in the truth claim box or the taste claim box? And I'm going to say, it really belongs in both. And so I'm going to give you some reasons for why you might think it should go in, in the taste box and some reasons why you think it might go in the truth box, okay? So, so uh, there's the two big questions, right? So which box does religion belong in? 
Um, here are the reasons for why you might think it should go in the taste lane. Well, it would promote peace, right? We'd stop fighting. If it was just, eh, you like one thing, I like another, no big deal. After all, you can't prove religion, right? So we only put things we can prove, maybe, in the, in the truth box, right? Scientific claims and so forth. So religion is something you can't prove. Also, isn't it arrogant to claim uh, that you have religious truth? You know, so it's not kind of arrogant. Wouldn't it be better to put it in the taste box? It's just too arrogant to say it's truth. And after all, isn't truth relative? So it's relative to persons. So that's, isn't that kind of what taste is, after all? Now, would it promote peace? You know, it probably would. It probably would promote peace. And I'm all for peace. I'd love to have more peace in the world. I'd like to have less war. It'd be great if we could coexist, right? That's such a clever little uh, bumper sticker. Um, it would be great. But if we say religion is no longer really true, that it's just a matter of feelings and what makes you feel good and personal preference, I'm afraid we might lose more than we gain. Maybe we'd gain more peace. But what would we lose? A lot of good comes out of religion when people believe it wholeheartedly and sincerely. Think about Martin Luther King Jr. A great part of his work was fueled by, motivated by, his passionate convictions about his religious faith. Right? His belief that all men were created equal by God. That was a big part of his argument of why segregation should end. We do need more religious tolerance in the world, but does this mean religion can't be true? You see, I think it's... I think it's I think it's wrong to say that if you believe it is true, then you're automatically going to be intolerant, and you're automatically going to have war and conflict. It's not impossible to believe something's true and still be peaceful and respectful and tolerant of others. What about science? Do we prove things there? Well, I'm not sure we really do. In science, we have a hypothesis, and we do research to affirm or refute it. If we get a lot of evidence in favor of the hypothesis, and no refutation comes along, we think it's probably true. But it isn't proven. In fact, many times refutation comes along later and we abandon it. But, so it isn't just a matter of taste, right? Even though we can't prove scientific claims, absolutely, right? Sometimes later we find out we're wrong and we're just accumulating evidence. But it doesn't mean that it's only a matter of taste, whether black holes exist, for example, right? It's still a matter of truth whether black holes exist, even though we can't prove some of the claims of science and astronomy. So just because we can't prove religion doesn't mean it shouldn't be in the truth box. Moreover, this, seems to be, this view seems to be self-refuting, or at least self-undermining. Think of the claim. So think of this claim, or this sentence. Any claim that isn't proven can't be true. Any claim that isn't proven can't be true. Now that's a claim, isn't it? I just made a claim, and here it is. Any claim that can't be proven isn't true. Well, can I prove that sentence? I don't think you can. You can't prove a sentence like that. It's a philosophical assertion. You can't prove it, and by its own criteria, it wouldn't be true. So I don't think we need proof in order to believe something's true. So I don't think that's a good enough reason to consign uh, religion to the taste box only. Well, what about this idea that it's arrogant to say you have the truth? It's arrogant, right? So maybe we should just move religion to the taste box because it's arrogant. But the problem with this is this, this claim, number three there, it's, um, it's like a knife that cuts both ways, right? It's like a knife that cuts both ways. Because if the claim is true, then sure, the Christian and the Muslim who claim that they have the one truth, sure, they're arrogant. But so is the person making the claim about arrogance. So is the person claiming number three. Because that claim itself is a particular view on religion. Right? It's a view that says we should consider all religions true or something of the sort like that. But that's a particular view. Right? Everyone has a religious view. Whether it's that there is no God and that religion is basically false or whether you believe in a particular religion, that's a view about religion. And if you think your view is correct, and you say you think it's true and that other people are wrong, that if you're an atheist and you believe religious believers are actually believing something false, then you're claiming to be right and they're wrong. Well, if, you're, if you think number three is correct, then you would have to say you're just as arrogant as anybody else. 
any religious view, any religious viewpoint, including the viewpoint that all religions are true, would be arrogant. But I think, I think we should think of it exactly the opposite way, that it's not arrogant to believe that you have the truth. It's not arrogant automatically to think that your views are true. Um, because I think you can, you can be a nice person and believe you have the truth. Lots of people, like Martin Luther King Jr. is a great example, who believed in Christianity, believed in a particular view, but wasn't arrogant about it, right? You don't have to be like this person, right? I know you can't read it. It says, I'm right, you're wrong, la, 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 I can't hear you. Right? You don't have to be like them. You don't have to be like this guy. You can believe something and be nice about it. You can believe something and be respectful and loving about it. What about number four? Well, is the truth relative to anyone? And so we should just consider religion as just personal preference. Well, there's a real problem with thinking that truth is relative. Um, look at these sentences, okay? Some sentences are what we call self-referring, which means they talk about themselves. So number one is self-referring. English sentences are fun, right? That's an English sentence, therefore it must be fun, right? So that's a self-referring sentence. Some sentences refer to themselves and actually go even further, they refute themselves, right? So look at number two. All English sentences have exactly four words. Well, wait a minute, that sentence does not have exactly four words, therefore the sentence refutes itself. It's an example, it's a counterexample, or an example of how number two can be false. Number three is self-refuting. You see why? I do not exist. Who doesn't exist? Me. You don't, who's talking? Me. I'm, I'm talking, and I don't exist. Right? You can't refer to yourself and say that you don't exist. And number four is self-referring and self-refuting. All truth is relative to the person or culture. Well, uh, number four allegedly is a truth. And if that truth is relative to the person or culture, then it's not always true, which means all truth is not relative to the person or culture. So you, ca you cannot really consistently believe in truth relativism and maintain any kind of coherence. And so just saying truth is relative, which is, I think is an incoherent position, is not going to be enough to really keep religion in the taste box alone. Okay, so I've given you two reasons, quickly, I'll give you two brief reasons, to think religion can fit nicely into the truth box. One is, out of respect um, for religious people, if you're taking them seriously and respecting their views, you can't just say, um, well, that's not really a truth claim, you're just talking about feelings. It's like, for instance, if, if uh, someone was a Hindu, and they came up to me and said, um, you know, I believe that when I die, I'll be reincarnated. And suppose I were to say to that person, well, I think what you're really meaning there is that reincarnation makes you feel good, but you're not saying that it actually happens, right? How do you think that person would look at me? How do you think they would respond? Would they go, oh yeah, that's, that's what I meant? No, they'd say, no, are you crazy? That's not what I meant at all. In fact, they might even say, no, reincarnation doesn't make me feel happy. It terrifies me, but I believe it's true. Right? So when people make truth claims, when people say there is no God but Allah, they don't mean Allah is my favorite God. They mean there is no God that exists in the universe other than the God of Islam, as revealed by Muhammad. Right? That's what they mean. They don't mean it's, he's my favorite. Right? They're making a truth claim. They're not just making a taste claim. So if we want to take them seriously, I think we should allow that some important religious claims belong in the realm of truth. So here are some truth claims also. Just to clarify one thing. Not all truth claims are true. Right? You can make a claim about reality. I can, there is only one person in this room. That's false. But it's a truth claim. Right? Suppose I believed it. Suppose I was you know, delusional. Right? If I said, this room is full of turtles. That's a truth claim. It just happens to be false. Right? So don't get nervous about putting things in the truth box just because they get to go in the truth box doesn't mean they're true. It just means they are claims about reality. Okay? So you look at a lot of these. Some of these are false, right? Which ones are false? Two, that's false. Six is false. 
Now, A is false, but it should have been true. Yeah. Right? So some things are false, but should have been true. Um, but not everything that we say, not every claim that we make is always true. But they are, nonetheless, they are truth claims. So even if you're an atheist, you can say, yeah, okay, maybe some religious claims belong in the truth box. They're just all false. Right? So you can be okay with putting them in the box. Doesn't, they don't automatically become true by magic when you put them in the box. Okay? So those are the two main reasons. But what about my second big question? Can all religions be true? So now we've said, well, okay, some religious claims can go in the truth box. Okay? They're, maybe they're really claims about reality. They're not just personal tastes. But could they all be true? Are they all, are they all right? right? Well, I'm going I'm to argue that they're not. Um, now take these two sentences, right? And this is an important concept called a law of non-contradiction. We're going to use this to, to kind of help ourselves along here. Here's two claims. K-State beat KU in basketball on that day. K-State did not beat KU in basketball on that day. Now assuming I mean the same thing in both sentences, could both of these be true? No, absolutely not. They exhaust all the possibilities, so one of them has to be true in this particular case. One of these must be true, but they cannot both be true because they contradict one another. Sentence two is the negation of sentence one, right? And so any two statements that contradict one another in this particular way, right, it's not enough that two sentences just de describe things a little differently, right? Like, I say that shirt's blue, somebody else says, no, it's kind of aqua. That's not a contradiction, right? That's just a slight difference. This is a contradiction, a flat-out, good old-fashioned contradiction. So take these, right? There's only one God. There are many gods. In other words, it is false that there is only one God, right? So are, is this a contradiction? Yes. Could they both be true? Could it be true that there is only one God and that there are many gods? Assume we mean the same thing by God, right? Whatever definition you want, just plug it in both sentences. Those, that's, that's a contradiction, right? Now, it's also interesting that these are claims made by a couple different religions. They can't both be true. So they might both be in the, in the truth claim box, but they can't all be true. And it turns out we have lots of, lots of examples of this, lots of religious claims that, that conflict and contradict. We have lots of them. Um, so here's a chart. This, this is super sketchy, right? So I told you I'm not a religion expert. If you're here, and I mean, I summed up some of like an entire religious view in like a word here. Okay, so this is, but it's just to kind of illustrate the point. You can get on me later about how poorly I describe things. But um, so here's four, four of the biggies, right? They have views about God, about maybe is there a problem in the world? Is there a solution? Is there life after death? Right, roughly, right? So. Look at the difference between Islam and Hinduism, right? So there's our one where Islam says there's only one God, Hinduism says there are millions of gods, right? Um, or that everything is God, which would also be a contradiction to Islam, right? So those can't both be true, right? Now notice I'm not arguing that one is true. I'm just saying, I can say I don't know which one's true, but they can't both be true. Or what about here um, between Islam and Buddhism? Right? Paradise or hell is, is what you expect after death. But with Buddhism, it's reincarnation or nirvana. You can live multiple times. Islam, no, just one life. Right? Those views, there is only one life, there are many lives, those are going to contradict. So they cannot all be true. So the idea, as, as nice as it sounds, that all paths lead to God or that all religions are true, just won't work. It just logically doesn't stand up. Okay, now. I do want to talk about one very important sort of objection to this view, or one very important alternate viewpoint that people often talk about. And that is, it comes with this story. Has anyone ever heard this story of the, of the blind man and the elephant? So roughly the story goes something like this. Um, there's a, a bunch of blind men, and they walk up to an elephant, and they're all trying to, de to describe what an elephant is like. They're going to tell us what an elephant is. And one person touches the trunk and says, oh, the elephant is like a big snake. Right? One person touches, say, the, the leg, and that person says, oh, an elephant is like a tree. It's like the trunk of a tree. Another person touches the tail and says, oh, an elephant is like a rope. Right? 
And in a sense, they're all right. They're all, they're all correct from their point of view, right? But they all have only partial information. They all have only part of the story, right? But none of them is, is necessarily wrong. They're just only getting part of the story. So maybe that's the way religion could work, right? But there's a real problem with this, with this account. There's a real problem with this story. And there's a couple different ways I could put it. One of the ways you could put it is, I could ask the question and I could say, okay, you got these blind guys, and they're all touching different parts of the elephant. How do they know what they're touching is actually an elephant? How do we know in the story that what they're touching is actually an elephant, and not a snake, and not a tree, and not a rope? How do we know this? Because you see the elephant. Because we have sort of this privileged position, right? That we actually see the whole picture. We see the truth about what an elephant is. And they're all kind of only getting part of the truth. They're all kind of partially right, partially wrong. And so what this is assuming, even though what this tries to prove is that, well, we should consider all religions to be true, because nobody has a privileged position of knowledge. But the only way the story gets off the ground is if you assume somebody has a privileged position of knowledge. You see what the problem is? And it assumes the very thing that it's trying to refute, which is that there is no privileged position of knowledge. The only way the story works is if you assume there's one person that's not blind who can see the whole, the whole truth and see the actual nature of reality. And they can tell the people, you got kind of that, that's kind of right, you're off, you're a little bit closer, you're not quite there. What if the, one of the blind men had said this? What if the blind man had said, um, I don't think this is an elephant at all, but a horse. We'd say, wow, he really got it wrong. Right? Wouldn't we say that? We wouldn't say, oh, well, I guess it's a horse and an elephant. No, we'd say, he, he got it wrong. The other guys are a little closer. Right? Or what if, the, what if the blind man contradicted one another? What if one of them said, an elephant's like a tree? And another one said, it is not like a tree. Well, then they couldn't both be right. Right? So, so even the elephant story has some serious flaws. It's a very clever parable. It's a very fun story. It, I'm sure it illustrates something interesting. But it certainly can't lend any proof or evidence or support for the claim that there is no privileged position of reference. I try to show that there are good reasons to think um, that religion really does belong in both the truth and the taste boxes. And that not all the important religious claims can be true at the same time. Now, I leave it up to you to figure out which religion is true. If they can't all be true, which one seems to cohere with itself and with reality the best? Which one has the most evidence and support? I've already said that I'm a Christian. I find the claims of Christ to be the best supported of all the religious leaders I've studied personally. Most of all, I found the message of Christianity make the most sense of, of human existence. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that afterward or during Q&A. Um, but I leave it up to you to explore further and figure out um, if they can't all be true, then which one is true. Thanks for being such a great audience and look forward to Q&A. I was an atheist till my junior year in college. Um, and, it was, and I didn't really consider any religion to be true, so that was my perspective. Um, and I was kind of arrogant about it, actually. Uh, and so, but it wasn't until my junior year that I really first heard and understood what the Christian message was. And um, honestly, I felt that I, you know, I had an experience of God um, that I couldn't, I couldn't deny, I really couldn't, uh, couldn't explain it any other way than to say it felt like confirmation that this was true. Now, that wasn't all I had to go on. I felt like that was the, the entry point, but I spent... The last, you know, the last portion of my life, uh, really studying and researching and trying to answer the hard questions, and and it's given me more confidence that I'm on the right path. But, but again, I'm not an expert in all religions. Just, uh, I'm not even an expert in Christianity. But I, I'm an expert in my personal experience, I suppose. Um, but I do think I have excellent support and evidence for the for the claims of Christianity. Someone said, um, what would you say? So there's an agnostic in the room. What would you say to people? Um, who don't, yeah, no, don't know what they believe we got about God, but certainly don't think that anything is certainly about Christianity is certainly untrue. Um, what would you say to a person like that? Kind of, okay. Or didn't make this video, 
So yeah, if you're an agnostic, usually means you're just saying, I don't know, right? I don't know what I should believe. It's not clear to me what's, what's true. And so I'm, they're kind of um, withholding. They're kind of withholding judgment, looking at the options, still trying to think about it. The jury's still out. I think that's a, that's a fair position. I think it's a, if it's an honest position, um, that you really, you've, maybe you've looked at the options a little bit, and they just seem to balance one another, and it's hard to really see one really winning out over another one. That's, I think that's a fair position. Um, I'd say it's, it's an important enough matter that you wouldn't want to just say, eh, whatever, right? Because there's a kind of agnosticism that could be sort of the lazy agnosticism or irresponsible where you just say, ah, I don't care, I'm not going to worry about it, I'm just going to go party or whatever. But if it comes to religion, I mean, you could be talking about sort of your eternal destiny. Um, I'm not sure that's a, a bet you want to take and say, ah, eh, I'll just not do anything. Um, seems like it's worth the effort and the time to put into it to really move yourself toward a conclusion, whatever that conclusion might be. And they asked, um, so this is just another personal question. So you think, do you believe if you were born in a different culture, um, you would still be a Christian? I have no idea. You know, it's funny. People do say that, like, what if you've been born in India? You'd be a Hindu. Or, um, or what if you've been born in Saudi Arabia? You'd be a Muslim. You know, but you were born in America, so you're a Christian. Um, I've never been quite sure what that, what the conclusion is that okay? So suppose that's true. So what follows, right? So some people they'll say, well, that means all religions are the same, or or they're all true, or something like that. But or you you only believe in Christianity because you were born here, not because of the evidence or because it has the best support or the best truth. You only believe it because of where you came from. Um, well, that if, that, if that's an argument against Christianity, or saying, if I, were a, if I were a Hindu, and I was from India, and you were saying, well, you only believe Hinduism because you were born in India. Therefore, Hinduism is not true. Well, that's a fallacious argument. That is a logical fallacy. It's a classic philosophers talk about called the genetic fallacy, which is saying it's criticizing a view because of how you, how you got it. Right? It's criticizing a view because how you came to believe it. Whether a view is true or not depends on how the view stacks up to the evidence. It has nothing to do with how you came to believe it. I could be a Christian because I got hit on the head, and that's why I'm a Christian, but that would have absolutely nothing to do with whether Christianity is true. Zippo. Right? Now, if, if it's supposed to follow from that cultural claim, if it's supposed to follow that, um, therefore, you know, you know, we, should, we shouldn't think Christianity is any more true than any other religion or something. Or, we, or therefore, you should be a pluralist. You should think all religions are equally valid or something like that. Well, the irony of that is, if you're a pluralist, like you think all religions are the same, um, I could say the same thing about you, right? If you had been born in Saudi Arabia, you wouldn't be a pluralist. Therefore, pluralism is false. That doesn't follow. But by your own logic, by the own by the same argument, I could I could argue that pluralism is false. So, so anyway, I mean it, it's true. Maybe I would have been a different religion, but that has no bearing on the truth of any religion. The other thing that's interesting, just to make sure people are thinking clearly on this, is Christianity is by no means a Western religion. I mean, where did it start? Israel, right? Not a Western culture, right? We have a sort of Western version of it here, right? Um, it's really a Middle Eastern or an Eastern concept. So, um, or it could be a blending of Eastern and Western ideas, you know? So just because, I mean, religions, where religions are, you know, where the population, and the religion of a population changes over hundreds of years, right? I mean, um, Christianity's growing in other continents now. It's shrinking in North America and Europe, and it's growing in Africa and Asia. Right? And same with other religions. I mean, Islam is growing in Europe, right? So, you know, it's hard to really tie it into one culture and say this is only connected to culture. But... Do you believe in miracles, and why? Oh, darn. I thought we were just going to stop with the first part of the question. <laughs> yes, next question. Uh, sure, why do I believe in miracles? Uh, why not? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Why do I believe in miracles? Um, I 
suppose I'd say, um, I don't know if I've personally ever witnessed or experienced a miracle, but I've heard accounts of miracles that I, I take to be trustworthy. You know, I don't have any bias against miracles. Like, I mean, some people just have an assumption that they are impossible right off the bat, therefore they can't ever happen. I don't have such a bias. I'm, I'm open to the idea, so. Um, but do you struggle um, with the whole inter literal interpretations of scripture at times? Um, well, I think this would go for all scripture, right? Whether it's Christian scripture, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu. Um, I take the literal parts literally. And I take the non-literal parts non-literally, right? So uh, now I'm, I'm more familiar with the Christian scriptures than I am with the others. Um, you know, but when if, she, if Jesus says, I am the true vine, um, I don't think that means Jesus is green and leafy. Right? So that's not a literal claim, right? Uh, he's not a plant. I, I don't think he is, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't struggle with, I mean, what I struggle with at times maybe is figuring out some parts are hard to tell whether it's literal or not. If you're um, evaluating different religious texts, then like what other kind of things would you want to think through Good. to evaluate that source? Good. Yeah, so... Um, if I'm evaluating a religious text, I might ask myself, um, does the text make historical claims about events or people or places? Okay, if it does, do we have evidence, like say archeological evidence, that those claims are true? Or do we have evidence that those claims are false? Do we have refutations of those, of those claims? Um, that's important, I think, right? If a, if a book claims that it's true and it makes claims about history, or actual events, it says, we, we're saying this actually happened in this place, and there's, there's either there's zero evidence for that, or there's evidence in support of it, or there's evidence against it. Those would all affect my attitude toward that book, right? Or if a book, you know, if I read a book and it said, um, this is the true God, and this is how you should live, and here are the commandments. Oh, and by the way, torturing children for fun is good. Um, that would be a problem. That would count against the book for me, right? I mean, I think we all sort of have a general sense of what's right and wrong, and we can tell when something's like way off, right? Right? I mean, there are some religions out there that say you know you should you know sacrifice your children to this particular god, or um, you should have ritual sex acts, involuntary ritual sex acts with people. And, um, I think that counts against them. I mean, if that's what their book says, and so much the worse for the book. If the book uh, is not coherent with itself, right? If the book contradicts itself. That could be a problem, right? Now you'd have to be, you'd have to do some research on that and really get clear. I mean, I, there's a thing on the internet somewhere. It's like a website which it shows all the 10 billion contradictions in the, this particular religious book, and then you look at them, you click on, them, and it's like they're not really contradictions. So you just have to get clear on what counts as a contradiction and what doesn't. So those are different ways of evaluating the book. And if the book passes those tests and seems to seems like it's a good source, then I'd say, okay, maybe I'd believe what it says. Right? And there might be other things I'd look at too. That's kind of a start. If I read a book, I mean, I, you know, the Bible is certainly one that's a, that's a difficult book. Um, there are some things in there that are really hard to understand, like why in the world is this here? This seems, this seems bad, right? And this, seem, this part seems really good. I love what Jesus says, you know, love and peace and all stuff, but really God, what was going on over here? That seems really harsh, right? So um, I struggle with those things. I ask those same questions. Um, but I, I, mean, I would try and, and study to try to see, is there a way to understand it coherently? Is there a way for it to all make sense and cohere together? If not, if ultimately it turns out that they're just contradicting one another, or they're totally inconsistent, that would be a, a reason against that book, right? So, um, and I'd say I'm still in process on some of those things with the Bible. I'm still working it out, you know. So, good question. Yeah? Uh, earlier in the talk, in the PowerPoint or whatever, you used the example of racism is morally wrong as a truth statement. Yeah. But that seems just really very, very subjective to me. Can you sort of or elaborate why it's a true statement? Yeah, great. Um, this is tough because um, all I can really say is um, the difficulty we're running into is some people think 
moral claims just don't belong in the truth claim box. They belong in the taste box, right? That they're just personal preferences or something like that. They're subjective. Um, now, if you do that, if you put moral claims all in the taste box, and they're all subjective, which means they're not actually true, they're not describing anything real outside of your own mind, right? So really, when you say racism is wrong, what you're really saying is, racism, yuck, right? Or I hate racism. Sure. But you're not claiming anything about universal truth. You're not claiming that it's really wrong for people to do it. I can't say anything about you, what's good for you. I'm only claiming about my personal preference, like my favorite ice cream. Um, if you go that route, right, um, you run into some really serious problems, right? If moral claims are not actually true, um, then you really can't say anything about Hitler and the Holocaust. You can't really say that it was, you can say, yuck, I don't prefer the Holocaust. I personally wouldn't want to participate or be in the Holocaust, but hey, it's what some people like that sort of thing, that's great. Right? Whatever, your pref whatever floats your boat, you know, kill Jews, don't kill Jews. Not, you know, I can only say what I prefer personally. To me, that sort of talk sounds insane. Right? Um, if, I mean, there's hardly, there's fewer things to me as clear as the wrongness, the moral wrongness of that. And I'm not saying it's just I pref don't prefer it or that it upsets me. I think, it, I think it's wrong for everyone. It would be wrong for anyone to do that. Right? Torturing babies for fun is wrong for everyone at all times, all cultures, all worlds, all universes. It doesn't matter. It'd be wrong for anyone to do it. Um, and if, if you think if you think truth is, you know, moral truths are relative or something like that, then you run into lots of other problems. Like um, if it's culturally relative, then you'd have to say ultimately that a moral reformer like Martin Luther King Jr. is an evil man. Because what the culture he lived in believed, right? If you count the South as a culture, they believe segregation was right. Therefore, it is right, right? And then, so what he was saying was wrong. And he was therefore immoral. So you could never have a moral reformer if truth is relative to the cultures. So, so if you go with it, it's relative to persons or relative to cultures, you run into all kinds of really bizarre situations. And I think, I think we all just, just know it's self-evident to us as much as our own existence that certain things, not everything, but certain things are just obviously immoral. Rape, right? Torturing babies for fun. Racism. You could come up with a list that would be universally, almost universally accepted, right? Which is usually a clue to its truth, too. So you could say all moral truth is subjective. Some people say that, right? But it's I just think you run into some really bizarre conclusions. Um, so, kind of sort of a follow-up on that question, yeah. I guess, would be, under that same line of reasoning, that's why law belongs in the truth box, is because if you put it in the taste box, everything just becomes so chaotic, and you know, all of these like very crucial parts about history, like brown people, or mm -hmm. things like that, just become sure. irrelevant, and yeah. don't make sense anymore. Yeah, well, that's a practical argument. I, I think there's more than a practical argument that can be made. Like, it would just be bad for society to put it in the taste box. But, but I, I think I want to put it in the truth box, not because, you know, that would be better for society or something, which seems like it could change over time. But I, I want to put it in the truth box because that's where it fits. It's like the square peg goes in the square hole, the round peg goes in the round hole. Um, truth, you know, truth claims about a person's guilt or innocence are objective claims about real events that belong in the truth claim box. You know, Christians believe Jesus died and came back to life. How is that rational? Yeah, so yeah, that's a miracle, right? So why, why believe in such a thing? Um, yeah, well, again, I mean, if you, were, if you were going to read a story in a particular book, a religious book, and you're reading a story, and we can all tell the difference between fables and, like, narrative, like historical narrative reports, right? So if I told you a story and I started with the words, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? <laughs> or if I said, once upon a time in a kingdom far, far away, what would you expect? The nightly news? No, you'd be expecting a fairy story, right? A fable, a myth, or some kind of 
you know, Allegorburg or something like that. But if I say, at 12 o'clock, at the intersection of Anderson and whatever street, uh, a 24-year-old man assaulted, blah, 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 blah. You, you listen to that and go, oh, a fable, a fairy tale. No, 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 you know it's like I'm, I'm reporting facts and events, right? So generally, we're good at, we can tell what we're reading, what kind of story we're reading, right? There's many, many kinds of stories. So when you read something like the New Testament, um, and you read the story about the resurrection, um, and of course, there's some cultural barriers there for us, and we don't read Greek, most of us. But when you read that, generally, most experts agree that people writing it were writing historical narrative. They were writing about it, actual events that they felt were actual real things. They weren't telling a fairy story. So then you say, okay, wow, they thought this was true. Then you have to stop to ask, are there any good reasons to think what they said was true? Um, and I think, you know, in a, in a lot of the cases, you know, um, when a book talks about certain historical events, you can ask, you know, is there other historical evidence outside that book for those events? Um, are there clues inside the story that might tell us more about its truth? Um, so, you know, I think there are clues like that. In the, I mean, there's certainly historical evidence outside of the Bible for Jesus' existence. Um, the resurrection, there's some things, there are certain facts that almost all scholars agree on, even atheist scholars agree on, that, um, that are best explained, I think, by an actual resurrection rather than a made-up story or a lie or something like that. So.